Picking up again in Exodus chapter 29, verse 21. And you shall take of the blood that is upon the altar and of the anointing oil and sprinkle it upon Aaron and upon his garments and upon his sons and upon the garments of his sons with him. Note, it seems that the blood and the anointing oil were mixed together and then sprinkled upon Aaron, upon his garments, as well as upon his sons, etc., etc. This proclaims the way in which the Holy Spirit works. He works entirely within the perimeters of the great sacrifice of Christ, typified by the blood. Romans chapter 8, verse 2 through 3, uh, con helps confirm that. Scripture, and he shall be consecrated, and his garments, and his sons, and his sons' garments with him. Also you shall take of the ram the fat and the rump, and the fat that covers the inwards, and the caul above the liver, and the two kidneys, and the fat that is upon them, and the right shoulder, for it is a ram of consecration. And one loaf of bread, and one cake of oiled bread, and one wafer out of the basket of the unleavened bread that is before the Lord. And you shall put all in the hands of Aaron, and in the hands of his sons, and shall wave them for a wave offering before the Lord. Notes, all of this specifies thankfulness for material blessings, but above all, for what Christ would do in order to redeem humanity. Wave offerings now are carried out by believers lifting their hands and praising the Lord. Hmm, verse 25. Well, I actually learned a little something from that. Verse 25. And you shall receive them of their hands and burn them upon the altar for a burnt offering for a sweet savor before the Lord. It is an offering made by fire unto the Lord. Notes, this signifies that our praises to the Lord are done strictly because of what Christ has done at the cross, and such are accepted by the Lord solely because of our faith in Christ and His atoning work at the cross. Uh, you can read more in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 13 through 18. I totally recommend you pause my speaking and look that up. Verse 26. And you shall take the beast of the ram of Aaron's consecration and wave it for a wave offering before the Lord, and it shall be your part. Notes. In other words, they could take this part for themselves for food, simplifying, or, or simplifying, symbolizing the eating of Christ. I believe he said at the dinner table where Judas betrayed him, Eat this, holding a piece of bread, for it is my flesh, and drink this, for it is representative of my blood, which is shed for many. Verse 27. And you shall sanctify the breast of the wave offering and the shoulder of the heave offering which is waved and which is heaved up of the ram of the consecration, even of that which is for Aaron and of that which is for his sons. Notes. The shoulder was to be heaved while the breast was to be waved. The former typified Christ taking our sins upon himself while the latter typified thankfulness that he had actually done so in the first place. Verse 28, and it, shall be, uh, <coughs> and it shall be Aaron's and his sons by a statute forever from the children of Israel, for it is an heave offering, and it shall be an heave offering from the children of Israel of the sacrifice of their peace offerings, even their heave offerings unto the Lord. Notes, when a burnt sin or trespass offering was presented to the Lord by the priest and on behalf of the people, then a peace offering was to be presented to the Lord. It signified that God had accepted the offering and peace was, with God was restored. Signifying, actually, not really. A part of the flesh of the peace offering was to be given to the priest and as well to the individuals who's, who offered up the sacrifice. They were then to have a feast celebrating the restored peace. Under the new covenant, we do the same thing now by simply praising the Lord. However, all of this tells us that our praises must ever be based on the fact of what Christ did for us at the cross. Uh, Colossians chapter 2, verse 14 through 15. You ought to read that. We'll eventually get to it, but I'm stuck in Exodus, obviously. Verse 29. And the holy garments of Aaron shall be his sons after him to be 
anointed therein, and to be consecrated in them. And that son that is priest in his steed shall put them on seven days when he comes into the tabernacle of the congregation to minister in the holy place. Notes. The high priesthood was to ever remain in the family of Aaron, which it did not, or which it did down through the centuries, with the exception of the last years when Jesus came. Then it was dictated by Rome. The consecration, which lasted for seven days, uh, seven being God's number of perfection, all typified the perfection of Christ. You can read Hebrews chapter 7, verse 26 through 27. As a matter of fact, I may start putting video annotations on my YouTube account and show you these exact verses as I go along. That sounds like a good plan. It'll take me forever and a day to get it done, though. <laughs> verse 31. And you shall take the ram of the consecration and roast his flesh in the holy place. And Aaron and his son shall eat the flesh of the ram and the bread that is in the basket. Notes, uh, which Jesus addressed in John chapter 6, verse 53 to 63. This is symbolic of one accepting all that Christ did at the cross. By the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, uh, notes, Jesus, he actually is the door. I think I said that before. Uh, verse 33. And they shall eat those things wherewith the atonement was made to consecrate and to sanctify them, but a stranger shall not eat thereof, because they are holy. Notes, a stranger could not partake of this repast, referring to the fact that the person who doesn't know Christ surely cannot partake of his blessings. John chapter 3, verse 3, uh, gives you quite a bit of insight, actually. Verse 34, and it ought of the flesh of the consecrations or of the bread remain unto the morning. Then you shall burn the remainder with fire. It shall not be eaten because it is holy. Notice, uh, this pertains to the fact that one must partake of all of Christ. In other words, the entirety of the cross, uh, which all of this typifies. You have to partake of all of Christ or absolutely none of him. He's either going to be all or he's going to be nothing. But you have to make your choice. Verse 35. And thus shall you do unto Aaron and to his sons, according to all the things which I have commanded you, seven days shall you consecrate them. And you shall offer every day a bullock for a sin offering for atonement, and you shall cleanse the altar when you have made an atonement for it, and you shall anoint it to sanctify it. Notes. This proclaims the fact that Christ. Uh, sanct uh, sanctified the cross but the cross didn't sanctify him because he really didn't need it this completely abrogates the erroneous doctrine as taught by some that Jesus died spiritually while on the cross this meant that he died as a sinner and went to the burning side of hell which it, you can't find it in the Bible the Bible doesn't uh, teach that redemption was afforded in hell but rather on the cross you can look at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 13 through 18, like I said two or three times, I think. Colossians chapter 2, verse 14 through 15. Despite the fact that the cross was a place where sin was atoned, still Christ, by his perfection, sanctified it in totality. Ooh, I love destroying false doctrine. Just, just give this junkyard dog a bone and I'll chew all over it. We'll have to pick up and... Exodus chapter 29, verse 37. Thank you very much.